Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a new podcast. We have rebranded for the third time. Is it the third time? This is the third time. It we- was Rule of Two, StarCast, and now it is The Jedi and the Jar Jar. Yeah, not to mention other podcasts that we've launched separately from this channel as well that have never gone anywhere. None have been lucrative, <laughs> but this one's going to work. <laughs> we're we're freaking determined. We are going to make a podcast that we can put out at least once a week. Or die trying. (laughs) Exactly. Anyway, guys, so the thought behind this podcast was all the in-universe stuff in Star Wars is really awesome. Mm -hmm. I love explaining all the in-universe stuff on the YouTube channel in depth, but Star Wars has sort of evolved to a point now where all of the out-of-universe goings on between, like, even the fandom... And, like, the filmmakers and the relationship between all of that stuff is now just as interesting and just as talked about. Mm -hmm. So it's, like, George Lucas' opinion on stuff. Uh, I posted a video about George Lucas, why he never pursued an episode 7. And that one would do just as well as a video documenting, like, a new lightsaber type. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely insane. So I figured since the format of my channel is very much explaining away parts of Star Wars... We could have more of a conversation about the Star Wars universe, about the goings-on inside of it, outside of it, somewhere in the middle of it, and that's what this is going to be. Yeah. We're going to be talking about a lot of the fandom, and then, of course, when there's news going on, we're going to be talking about that, but a lot of the reception to the news, kind mm-hmm. of like a, a source of the middle ground of Star Wars, where not everything is going to be just in-universe. Yeah. So today... We figured we would talk about why a lot of people seem to hate the rise of Skywalker. And I think I have some really interesting points. Um, I should start out kind of saying that I very much enjoyed the rise of Skywalker. I realize that it has a lot of problems. I note that it has a lot of problems. But at the end of the day, to me at least, it very much felt like a Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. And it felt like the franchise was getting back on track in an appropriate way. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's a fair point. And I don't want to be destroyed over this point. I'm going. I'm trying to. Too late. Yeah, I want to word this in a way that I think will make sense. And that is, while I recognize that this film has problems, and it is not the greatest movie ever made, people do get excited at the opportunity to hate something. That is absolutely true. And, outrage culture. Yeah, outrage culture. And you know what? It's fair. It's. You, it's something that we've both experienced, I think, a little bit. I remember uh, when Batman v Superman came out, you and I literally just screamed outside in a parking lot, like, how could they make a movie that bad? But there, there is something that uh, is prevalent in fandom culture where if there's something you don't like, you want to be in a community where you all can vocalize your hatred for something. It is entertaining. It is entertaining. There's, there's always something entertaining about it. But... When it is all unleashed on a movie that doesn't really deserve it is when it gets weird. I think that for a lot of... Now, this is going to be a little bit weird, but I think The Rise of Skywalker, from certain points of view, does deserve hate. And I'm going to get into this a little bit No, I agree with you 100%. But I don't think it's because of the contents of the movie. Mm -hmm. I think it's the contents of the trilogy where where The Rise of Skywalker deserves a lot of the hate. Yeah. And... I guess I'll just get right into the point right now. The The Last Jedi was a poorly received film for a lot of the fandom. Mm-hmm. I would say like 50-50. Like that's the most divisive Star Wars movie I've ever seen or even heard about. I, yeah. But with that said, before the vocal, uh, the minority that was really vocal were the people mm-hmm. that hated it. And now it's sort of flipped around. Now that the people that hated The Last Jedi kind of got what they wanted a little bit, Mm -hmm. now it's the group that was won over by the events of The Last Jedi that's really upset. Yeah. Which I think is super interesting, actually. Um, All of these people on Twitter that really got behind this sort of meta take on Star Wars that The Last Jedi had are (laughs) really pissed off because it did away with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the filmmakers are kind of playing it in the middle. They're saying like, oh no, we never really got a, did away with it. We're just like expanding our universe. Like, yeah. For example, the whole message in The Last Jedi is that anybody can be force sensitive. 
the little kid at the end that moves the broom. He's just a stable boy and he's force sensitive. Mm-hmm. Ray is just a nobody and the force chose her. That's like the message of The Last Jedi, right? Mm-hmm. Anybody can wield the force. It doesn't have to be like, not anybody can wield the force, but anybody can have the ability to. Mm-hmm. It's random. Um, but then you have the rise of Skywalker where it's like, no, Ray, you're not just some <laughs> nobody that can wield the force. You're a Palpatine. You're and a descendant it, of the most evil man and powerful man that's ever lived. Yeah, so it's like, <laughs> it, it does away with that concept. Yeah. And then it's kind of like, it. The Last Jedi builds up a different confrontation between Ray and Kylo and a lot of the people think that they just like swapped out Snoke for Palpatine which mm-hmm. they did they're like oh crap they cut Snoke in half so like I don't know how to continue this story b- behind yeah. just the fact of like we're getting Snoke out of here and we got to introduce the new bad guy mm-hmm. that's going to fulfill the same purpose that Snoke would have fulfilled but that did away with mm-hmm. all of the plot threads that some people enjoyed about the last Jedi yeah and I didn't enjoy The Last Jedi as far as what it did to the universe. And that's why I really liked The Rise of Skywalker. So I'm very much on the other end. But at the same time, it's like The Last Jedi did do things that entertained a group of people. Yeah. And another big example is people love the character of Rose Tico. I personally don't understand it. I, don't th- I think Kelly Marie Tran is, is super <laughs> nice. And great, but I don't relate to Rose Tico. I think that she's really annoying. But at the <laughs> same time, people that like relate to that girl mm-hmm. relate to Rose to see her blatantly just sidelined like that so hard in the mm-hmm. Rise of Skywalker, where she has like a minute thirty of screen time. I can see why that would piss people off. Yeah, not only is she sidelined, but she's like friend zoned <laughs> yeah. in the movie. And it's funny, too, because even when you just said that, like, I thought you were being sarcastic for a second and you were going to get to a punchline. And then you just, like, said, like, I just don't get it. Um, and as far as your point about how it's more of a, a distaste or, like, a hatred for the trilogy and not so much this one individual movie, it's absolutely true because this is the only, like, three-act structure I think I could think of that just ignores each act of the movie to appease fans it almost operates as like a halloween sequel where they come out with halloween 11 and they're like forget all the other halloween movies we're doing our own movie it it (laughs) almost feels like specifically though forget the events of the last jedi yeah but the last jedi is like forget the events of the force awakens and there's no consistency like there's no narrative not so much forget the events but forget the plot lines that were established yeah and um you could it, almost view The Rise of Skywalker without watching The Last Jedi. Almost, yeah. It, it literally like tells its own story in between. The only thing you would be confused about is like where Snoke went. <laughs> right. You know? But other than that, like everybody's just kind of in the same places as they started. Yeah, it's like The Rise of Skywalker is episode 8.5 and 9. Mm-hmm. It's, Wait. it's really uh, unfortunate because part of the reason why the Rise of Skywalker fails at the things that it does fail at is because it literally has to fill you in on a story that they made no movie for. It has to, like, constantly inform you of, like, where these characters have been, what they're doing, and um, not let it breathe. It has to say to you, oh, Palpatine's around now. They tell you that in the title crawl. Yeah. And they wouldn't have had to do that if The Last Jedi wasn't terrible. (laughs) But unfortunately, it's just a really flawed movie. And this movie suffers uh, because of that flaw. And they were just like scrambling to make some sort of ultra satisfying movie. And because a of, cohesive movie, too. Yeah. And it, it kind of just suffers from all of that. And not to say that this movie is like a terrible movie or that it isn't ultimately better for Star Wars. Because I do think that The Rise of Skywalker is about as good as we could have gotten this last movie in the trilogy and has satisfied fans enough to the point where I think people are generally on back or back on Star Wars, especially with the additional help of like the Mandalorian and stuff. Like generally I think fans are pretty happy right now. Yes. Um not so much on Twitter. Yeah. But that we gotta keep in mind that the people that like aren't 
liking Star Wars right now and like voicing their opinion for that mm-hmm. for it are really the minority. Uh, yeah. Pretty much everybody that I've talked to about the Rise of Skywalker that's just a movie goer mm-hmm. did not like the Last Jedi, and they did not. And now they do like the Rise of Skywalker. Mm-hmm. I think that's subject to change because people get most of their opinions now from the internet. Yeah. I spoke to people that like um, have that really enjoyed their last Jedi. And now sometime later, it's like they hate it. Yeah. And I've talked, I've talked to people that say that, that believe like this whole trilogy is just like a farce. Mm -hmm. And I just look at them like complete awestruck. It's like, You've got to be kidding me. Like, you think that The Force Awakens, Rogue One, Solo, and all of this stuff is just a farce? Mm-hmm. Like, it's clearly not. Yeah. Like, there, it, there's clearly production and care and, and in a lot of cases, really good writing behind this. Like, mm-hmm. you're going to judge the remits of the entire Disney era of Star Wars with the few story choices that you didn't like in The Last Jedi? Yeah. Like we, I won't name this individual obviously, but we <laughs> talk to this person all the time, and he just mentions why he thinks that just the rise of Skywalker is going to be just this hilarious screw up of a movie. Yeah, like he's just excited to watch it all crash and burn. You right, know? but it's not, there's nothing before that that I think would really indicate it. Mm-hmm. And I think um, it's a fair point. I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'll go off then. Then I think Wait. also by the same token. That it's not okay for everybody to think that these movies are flawless. I was going to say, it is fair for people to change their minds on these things because we're definitely those people too. I remember when we both saw The Last Jedi, we we were like, oh, you know, it's pretty good. And then as you kind of sit around, it's like, oh, it, it feels worse over time. You start realizing what's happening. And I remember even with The Force Awakens, and I don't believe this is a valid thing, but um, I had a friend that... Like, the day The Force Awakens came out, he was like, that was such a good movie. I loved it. And then, like, a day later, I talked to him, and he was like, it's so bad. Like, I can't believe how bad the movie is. And I was like, what happened? Like, you watched it one more time, and suddenly you've completely 180'd your opinion. And he was like, bro, it's just a new hope. It's the new hope point two. Um, and there, there is some degree of fairness to that, where you are allowed to change your mind, but what is, I think... The bad part of that, the thing that's corrosive in the fandom, is that people just kind of align their opinions with people who have public opinions. And, like, you're you're more likely to agree with the person that you're listening to than you are to just form your own opinion. That's kind of a thing that's prevalent in our culture today. So, whenever there's a mass consensus on a movie, there's going to be people that will automatically flock. And then there's going to be the counterculture people that are just going to disagree adamantly with everything. And the idea that this franchise has just put out nothing but, like, bad content is absolutely incorrect. They have made good movies. The Force Awakens, I think, is a really good movie that sets up a lot of stuff that is unfortunately then tarnished with The Last Jedi. And I think the Rogue One movie is pretty solid, and I think that Solo is a pretty solid movie, too. I don't think either of them are, like, inspiring other than that Darth Vader scene, like, mm. which is worth watching on repeat a hundred times a year, probably. Like, every three days, watch the Darth Vader scene, you'll probably be happier. <laughs> but, um, th- there's definitely quality here. It's just, like, unfortunately, this trilogy wasn't planned out very well at, or at all. And now, because of that, t- Star Wars is, again, just going through this motion of being slightly tarnished, like it did with the prequels. And then now there's this super divided fan base of people going, I think this is great. And people going, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Why did you destroy my childhood? I think the common consensus with the prequels, though, was that they were bad. Mm -hmm. And now it's changed a lot over Mm -hmm. time. Like most people defend prequels now as opposed to like, you know, criticize them. I've said it a million times before. The movies of the prequels aren't great, but the story of the prequels is really great. They're ambitious. That's for sure. Um, they, they strive to tell you new stories. Uh, and I think that's probably where most of the recent, like, affection for the, the prequels has come from. Because although I think The Force Awakens is a better movie than any of the prequels, and I know there's probably going to be a million people that hate me for saying that, I do think, like, if you look at the, what happens in Revenge of the Sith, it's trying to tell you a much larger story than The Force Awakens does. 
but that doesn't necessarily make it a better movie. And that's just on a filmmaking cinematic level. It's not a better directed movie. It's it's kind of lazily directed in a lot of ways. I mean, I'll, half of that movie is just like shot, reverse shot, and then everything's against a blue screen, which is not to say that there's no blue screens in The Force Awakens or anything like that. It's just like there is a craft to filmmaking and to directing that those movies, I think, lack. But that doesn't. That The Force Awakens has. That The Force Awakens has, but that doesn't mean that the stories that they're trying to tell you in those prequels don't have ambitious elements to them that are really good for the universe. I think that the prequels are probably the best thing that have happened for the Star Wars, um, like, Legends universe. Like, there's so much to go off of. I mean, I'm sure that even you, uh, somebody who makes videos on this every day, probably pull the most that you make videos on, like, with content that came from those prequel movies, right? Yeah. I mean... It's, it's probably a 60-40 split. Yeah. It probably 60% is prequels and then 40 is literally everything else. Yeah, because there's just so much. Every frame of those prequels is so densely packed. Yeah, it may look like crap, <laughs> but it's still interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interesting stuff. There's some stuff that's less interesting that is really frustrating, like how Darth Vader invented C-3PO or he made C-3PO. That's frustrating. But like... Overall, those movies do have some sort of ambition that these new movies really don't. And that was George Lucas's major critique mm -hmm. of The Force Awakens, is he felt like it was retelling a story that had already been told, his story, and he felt like the, as far as technology is concerned, it never really pushed the boundaries. Because yeah. what George Lucas wanted to do was every time he made a Star Wars uh, trilogy, he wanted it to push the boundaries and the foundation of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, uh, the sequel trilogy, George Lucas says one of his ideas was to explore the Force on like a microscopic level. Yeah. Like, honey, we shrunk the kids, meet Star Wars. We're going <laughs> to figure out more about the midichlorians. <laughs> that sounds so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's, that's what he wanted to do is he mm -hmm. wants to push the boundaries with every new version of Star Wars. He wanted to explore the wills. What yeah. controls this ultimate version of of our characters mm -hmm. and the fate of these characters on this microscopic, all-powerful level. Mm -hmm. And I hate that. You th you hate that? I hate the oh, idea. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Like, I think exploring the wills is interesting. The whole thing where it's like, uh, honey, I shrink the kids. It's like George Lucas watched Ant-Man and saw him go into, like, uh, the quantum realm and was like, what if those were um, midichlorians? <laughs> All those bright, flashing lights. And what if those midichlorians had consciousness and made all the good people good and all the bad people bad like that would be an unfortunate movie but it would be a different movie that's for sure there might be something interesting to it right i think that though you can take star wars in a different way that's not insane yeah i would say that that's <laughs> not star wars anymore yeah it definitely doesn't sound like it uh, and i feel like there's such a good potential to just like take a ton of these star wars stories that not everybody knows or very little people know and and turn them into these bigger movies and make a more interesting universe like everybody's talking about making an old republic movie or an that's old what's republic going to movie. happen i yeah. i would put all of my i would put my entire net worth on the fact that the next trilogy that we will be getting mm -hmm. will be an old republic trilogy yeah because why not do that that's the best idea you get to go in a time that is something that is already explored that there's foundations to build on, but at the same time tell a story that we haven't really seen. Right, but the reason Disney didn't do that initially is because they probably didn't have enough faith. Yeah. One of two things. They mm -hmm. didn't have enough faith in their own vision and their own product of Star Wars mm -hmm. initially, and they didn't have faith in their own ideas that they could create and expand a new era of Star Wars, and then I don't think that's true. I yeah. should say that. Or they want to milk all of the iconic imagery to the absolute core of Star Wars and its mm -hmm. very fiber, which I think is absolutely true. Yeah. They're, they can't open up a galaxy's edge with like the brand new cool shit because all the old guys are going to be like, oh, I'd be better if it was the Falcon. Yeah. I 100% agree. And I don't even fault them for that so much because if you're ever going to make a sequel trilogy, you might as well do it when all of those actors are alive. And look now, I mean, Carrie Fisher's past and... If if you wanted to tell those stories now, she couldn't even be in them. Um, that being said, there is definitely a thing where they couldn't trust any sort of new direction. And a new direction in Star Wars kind of tainted Star Wars for a little while. People, when, when Disney bought Star Wars and was planning their movies, were very, very uh, like against what happened in the prequel movies. 
And because of that, they were probably like, let's not make another set of prequels. You know, let's let's not tell this crazy new story with like a hundred Sith in it. Like people are just gonna hate that. Let's get back to what people liked, and then they got back to what people liked. And, and what... then Ryan Johnson said, <laughs> "I know better than everybody yeah. else." Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, they just kind of wasted a bunch of time. They they made some good stuff. They made some bad stuff, and the fan base is still just as divided as ever you know i still do not know why to this day they gave complete creative control to ryan johnson i think they just have a horrible track record with picking people and trusting people um we know that from how many directors they've fired it seems like like, with the whole director thing mm -hmm. it seemed like they were trying to remedy a mistake with like what had happened with like rogue one almost and like trying to enforce all this stuff on gareth edwards they like they just told ryan johnson he could have it all and mm-hmm. then once they saw the backlash of the Ryan Johnson thing, I feel like they put more like constraints on the solo guys. And yeah, it's just like there's a middle ground here where where everything needs to be and needs to work together. It's like you need to hire people that are going to further the Star Wars universe that aren't going to be told like this is mm-hmm. not what you want. Yeah, and not only further the Star Wars universe, but further it on the backs of the plan that you've already made. It's not like you should just hand a movie to some guy and say, all right, well, we don't really have a plan. You make the plan. It should be like, this is our 10-year plan laid out, and these are the stories we're going to tell. And you have creative freedom to make this movie. I want you to make it as best as you can, as visually striking as you can. If you have any ideas, offer them because we're fans of good ideas. But um, this is where we want this story to end. We want Palpatine to do this. We want Rey to be this or whatever. And then give them the reins. But don't just say, you tell the story. You make the story. That's a terrible way to go about that business. Marvel would probably never do that. I don't think they ever have. No, Marvel sets up 10-year plans. But Star Wars couldn't put together a five-year plan. Mm -hmm. They couldn't. They they didn't know where they were going. I think that the the people, it just shows the leadership and the problems within the companies themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that we've talked about this before, but I think Jon Favreau is the absolute perfect pick to just give Star Wars to. Yeah. I think he is. He's not only an an amazingly talented director, not only has he proven himself to be a great showrunner uh, for The Mandalorian, and also just like a Star Wars fan being the voice of Pre Vizsla in uh, The Clone Wars. It's like... Yeah, before Lucasfilm Before Lucasfilm, yeah, like, he didn't have to do that. I'm sure that he wasn't making, like, some awesome check on that. And if you listen to Pre Vizsla's Mm -hmm. voice, it's like John Favreau isn't just phoning in it. Yeah, no. John Favreau. He cares. Yeah, he cares. Like, I am completely convinced that, like, he's a Star Wars fan. And also, it's also important to, to mention that he's so close to Marvel, and he knows how that ship is supposed to be run. Another thing that I really liked about Jon Favreau is George Lucas stepped foot on the set of The Mandalorian and Jon Favreau showed him around and he legitimately asked for his advice. He was curious about his advice. He didn't just take what was given to Mm -hmm. him and then threw it aside like what happened with... I don't know if you heard this whole thing. It came out about in Bob Iger's autobiography. No, I don't believe I have. Bob Iger wrote about how George Lucas felt betrayed because he offered up all of these ideas for the sequel trilogy. Oh, yeah, no, I did hear about this. And they were not used. Mm -hmm. But I feel like Jon Favreau, like, just to get Lucas on the set and to listen to him and to walk him through it and not just, like, listen to him and pat him on the head. Yeah. Like, I feel like George Lucas probably feels. Mm -hmm. But, like really listens to his ideas and takes the input and it's like we're going to listen to you but at the end of the day like if i don't think this is a smart creative choice we're going to move in our own direction Mm -hmm. but john favreau has absolutely shocked me with a bunch of the stuff in the mandalorian i i I genuinely care about mando Mm -hmm. i think every single character that they've introduced has been likable yeah they're fun they're likable and they're instantly recognizable Mm -hmm. and I feel for a character that's been in two episodes of the show, like mm-hmm. when Quill dies, that hit that hits me really hard. Even like IG Eleven, who is a character that his entire character is I don't have a soul, I am not alive, I am a droid and I am here to kill. And when when that character goes out and it's like I'm going to sacrifice myself, it's fine, I'm a robot, this doesn't matter, and then like there's an emotional connection, not only between the characters, but you, because you're invested in this this droid. It's, it's hard to do that. It's really difficult to convey emotion in any sort of artistic medium. And 
to be able not only to do that, but to tell an interesting story with fun, likable characters that, like, I can't be more excited to watch in a second season. You know, even, um, what is his name? Grief? Uh, Grief Karga. Grief Karga, I think, is a fun character. And it's like, he doesn't have to be, but he's he's really good. He's a fun character. And that's what we need. We yeah. need something that is run like The Mandalorian on uh -huh. a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Because each episode of The Mandalorian had a different director, but it had one vision behind it. Exactly. And imagine how much better all this stuff would be if they just kind of looked at that and went in those footsteps. Because I think that's like the biggest flaw with Rogue One is none of the characters are all that fun or compelling, not at all compared to like uh, The Mandalorian. And if if they were able to do stuff like that, the man or the Rogue One would have been this massive like hit with everybody. I think it's definitely still a hit, and people like it. But does anybody want a Cassian and and Andor series? Nobody no, wants that. that. Yeah, not a single person wants that. But would I be open to like some sort of like uh, what is it, Cara? Uh, Cara Dune. Cara Dune series. Like I could see that being good. She's an interesting character. Same with any of the other supporting characters in The Mandalorian. But, I mean, I I just don't think that they've at all stepped foot into that territory. And now they're, like, trying to take those baby steps into it where they're they're trying to form a plan. It's just unfortunate that right now we don't know very much about it. Another, going back to The Mandalorian, don't forget that, like, Baby Yoda straight up stole the utter spotlight from Palpatine. Mm-hmm. Like it's a good point. In all of Star Wars, people are way more invested in Baby Yoda than they were in the Return of the Greatest Sith Lord of all time, mm -hmm. because it's new and different and smart and fun and fun. It is smart. It asks questions, and there's this anticipation for those answers. When when um, Palpatine shows up, it's really not that. It's more like, oh, okay, he's back. Um, okay, and then you can be like, well, how did he survive? I guess he just did, and does it really matter? No. <laughs> what happens at the end? He dies. <laughs> like, there's, there's not a whole lot to go off of. It's... Where it's Baby Yoda, the story of Baby Yoda is like, how did this child get here? Mm -hmm. How is Mando going to return it to the Jedi, or is he going to return Baby Yoda to... Um... Yoda's species as yeah. a whole. That, what that's what the do the that's... remnants of the Empire want with him? Yeah. Is he like a descendant of Yoda's? Is he like, or related? He doesn't, he's probably most likely not a descendant because um, Yoda's probably a good boy. But um, there's, there's so much like to wonder about. And then like, as you get to the end of the Mandalorian and uh, there's a new thing the, introduced. The, the Moff Gideon character, you're just like, I'm I'm just so curious to see what kind of a villain he's going to be because he's he's automatically compelling the second he's on screen. Like you feel that he's a threat, he's intimidating, he's played by a great actor, and then they they have that little teaser at the end, which I guess we probably shouldn't say, even though we've done a lot of spoilers already for this stuff. Um, the dark saber shows up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the dark saber shows up, and you're just like, oh, like n they're not ignoring the past. And they're moving Even forward. Even Clone Wars stuff. It's yeah. like, thank you! Just like, it, it is, it happened. Don't pretend it didn't happen. I get that, like, when The Force Awakens came out, that was what was cool. And The Force Awakens mentioned some Clone Wars stuff a little bit, because they said the word clones. But, like, they, they flat out ignore all of that history. And it's not something you should do, because this is a universe that has a history. So use it and build off of it. Don't just tell your own story with nothing and therefore tell no story. You know? I mean, I'm I'm so curious to see what they're going to do with the second season of The Mandalorian and with uh, the Obi-Wan series. And the rumored Darth Maul the series. The rumored Darth Maul series, which, I mean, I would <laughs> love. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that off the back of The Mandalorian, I've given the Disney Plus crews, like, my complete trust and I hope they don't ruin that. <laughs> but a Darth Maul series would be so cool. Because he's the coolest part of, like, the Clone Wars and Rebels, I think. Yeah. He's he's automatically just, like... I, I think that if you go on YouTube and you look up all the clips of, like, different things that happen in Clone Wars and, and Rebels, like, Darth Maul's got, like, the most views. Yeah. Like, everybody just loves him. And he's a character and that... they gave him a character. They the gave Clone him a character. Wars. And you got to remember that when Darth Maul was cut in half in The Phantom Menace, his character was like, I scowl. Yeah, I'm a guy 
Palpatine tells me where to go, I go there. <laughs> and now I, it's like he's he's like unhinged mm-hmm. and he's like he knows he's not the strongest around and mm-hmm. that that kind of pisses him off a yeah. little bit. And he like has this utter fascination with Obi-Wan Kenobi mm-hmm. and you also get the impression that yeah, he's really powerful, but he's also got something to prove. Mm-hmm. Where it's like when Palpatine walks in a room, he he got he has nothing to prove. Yeah. He is the all-powerful being. Nobody even steps close to him. Yeah. But Maul he doesn't in, even care. He doesn't care. <laughs> Same with like Yoda. Yeah. But it's like when Anakin steps in a room or, or Maul step in a room, they got something to prove. Even uh, Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren has something to prove whenever he's in a room. And to to see that, I would hope that if they were to make a, a Darth Maul series, they would continue with that. And I'd hope they'd have the right people attached to it. we got so it. many stories. We can ha- we, you can make Darth Maul like not the worst of the villains you yeah. can just tell the story of the inquisitors hunting darth maul yeah and i think that if you even just look at that prequel trilogy i think it was a real bad idea to kill off darth maul at least in the movies obviously he survives but he could have been a great series villain obviously under the the veil of like palpatine's watch and um power and all that but like he would have been just such a more compelling character if they stuck with it and not to say I don't like that we've gotten Count Dooku, because obviously Count Dooku is a great character, and um, he's very different. From he's Maul. very different from Maul. Uh, if they kept Darth Maul, we probably wouldn't have seen General Grievous or anything like that. But um, still, it's a character I, that I, I like think where has they a... took the direction of Maul's story, though. Where yeah, it's like, they, they he's do like this assassin, and but then, like I said later, it's like once he's been cut in half, now he's an assassin with something to prove. Mm-hmm. This brings us into another thing that Star Wars is. A, I think if you guys take anything away from this this episode, it's that Star Wars is moving in a good direction. Yeah, it is. Uh, they have Clone Wars Season 7 coming out mm-hmm. with brand new uh, animation that's like the older animation. Yeah. Because that's another thing. Rebels just felt cheap sometimes. No, it really like, I does. I like the stories in Rebels, a lot of it, but it's cheap in comparison to Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, though, bringing that back, and there's even rumored now a sequel to Rebels. Mm-hmm. A series coming out. That'd be a lot of fun. They, In order to move forward, sometimes you need to make mistakes. And I think that they're learning. I think they've realized that uh, you can't just jump into things just because you want to make a lot of money right away. And you have to plan things out. You have to hire the right people. And you can't push your vision and your agenda on a universe that's clamoring for another one. You know what I mean? Star Wars right now doesn't need the same story told just to satisfy all the people that have been so vocal about how much they've hated the prequels. What they need is to tell something that's new and fresh like The Mandalorian. And the second you do that, suddenly you have everybody's attention. That's what I think The Mandalorian has probably taught Disney is we made a good new Star Wars movie. It's set in a time that people kind of understand. It's something that we've kind of seen already. There's uh, stormtroopers they look like the stormtroopers from the original trilogy but by no means is this a rip off of the original trilogy is it it's not um it's not this story we've seen it's a new character in a new time and it's interesting and that is what they need to make they can't keep doing oh we're going to tell you the story you've already seen they can't give us a Cassian Andor series cuz nobody will like it it would be ridiculous they can't keep telling stories between Episode 3 and 4, with the exception of Obi-Wan, because everybody wants that. There's a good 20-odd year story that Obi-Wan has not told, and we need to know it. Because <laughs> that's the only time we don't know, really. You know? Like... Uh, yeah, that's it. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> I'm talked out of this topic. Yeah? I'm completely empty. You're empty. Your soul has been drained of all of its happiness. Not happiness. <laughs> I'm excited going forward. We got no, a I lot of too. good stuff to look forward to. 2019, I think Star Wars took a bunch of good steps in the right direction. For sure. It's not perfect. Mm-hmm. But I think one day we can get to something really, really, really yeah. special. Is anything perfect anyway? No. Nothing's perfect. But I'm talking about like we could one day get a series of Star Wars movies that are just... Yeah. Great. I think the Old Republic series, if it were to come out, which it most likely would and should, uh, will probably do a lot of good for this franchise, assuming that they're going to make real movies and not something stupid. They need to make a real, good, well-thought-out film built on the backs 
of the people that have told these stories, whether it was in a comic book or in a video game or anything like that. You can't just ignore those different mediums of this story because it wasn't something that Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker were in. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You have to acknowledge what came before and freaking just straight up steal it. <laughs> like you, there's all this great content that like the normal moviegoer has not seen. Just make them see it. Make me see it. I want to see it. Those cinematics for like the old Republic game are the coolest thing in the world. Make a movie with that stuff, please. But it looks like <laughs> you got that death stare. <laughs> you got those Sith eyes going, let's finish. <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, I'm just like, I got nothing else to say. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, yeah. that was the first episode of The Jedi in the Jar Jar. Oh, yeah. My friend here, Stuart, is the Jedi. And I am the Jar Jar. And by the way, his name is not Stuart. Stop but calling me that on Twitter. He loves it when you call him Stuart on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that started. That's not my name. But it's kind of funny now. It is funny. You know what? I'm okay with it. I say adopted as the, the new nickname. Stuart. But yeah, he's the I Jedi. I just want to know where it started. It, probably somebody just tweeted it and then caught on. You know, how else does anything start? It's like a disease, you know? <laughs> yeah, but Jedi, Jar Jar. I'm the Jar Jar because I don't know anything about Star Wars. I'm dumb. He's smart. He has to inform me on everything. It's really funny. It's a good contrast, I think. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Stay tuned for another one, I guess. It'll be here somewhere on YouTube. Anyway. Bye. <laughs>